another week, another edition of my men's college tennis power rankings. With multiple upsets occurring throughout the country, this week's rankings see quite a few shakeups up and down the board. A quick shout out to Georgia, NC State, Stanford, and Northwestern for the upsets they pulled off this week. Though none of those teams ended up in my top eight, their wins absolutely influenced the composition of this list. For a reminder of my power ranking rules, be sure to check out our website, crackrackets.com, to read this in article form. Also, be sure to go listen to this week's College Tennis Roundtable mini-break episode as Matt Stachowiak, Chris Halioris, and I extensively recap what truly was a dramatic week in the men's college tennis world. Coming in at number 8 this week, the 13-3 Buckeyes of Ohio State. I certainly did not expect Ohio State to lose three straight matches at any point this season. And yet, after dropping decisions to UNC, Georgia, and Stanford, that's where this team finds itself entering March. It would be quite easy to write these past two losses off from Ohio State as typical early outdoor bullshit. But it's the way they've lost that has me concerned. Dropping a 4-0 match to UNC looks worse on paper than it did in reality, and it's worth keeping in mind they played a 4-hour, 4-3 thriller with Wake about 12 hours before that match. But to lose the doubles point in three first sets against Georgia, then take doubles only to drop four singles matches at Stanford, a team that, by the way, just took big losses to both TCU and Texas over the past week, is not the way a Ty Tucker coached team typically responds to adversity. Freshman Justin Boulay and Robert Cash have both struggled mightily in singles thus far, leading Coach Tucker to make multiple lineup adjustments already this season. Freshman struggles are to be expected, but given the seeming parity between so many of these top teams, Buckeye fans will need both guys playing better tennis come May. Even with Michigan's hot start and Northwestern's recent win over Columbia, I still see the Buckeyes as the prohibitive favorites entering Big Ten play. Cannon Kingsley's looked as good as any player, freshman or otherwise, in the country this season, and I've seen firsthand the exceptional leadership capabilities of upperclassmen John McNally and Kyle Selig. It also helps that many of the conference matches they play will end up indoors. Overall, Ohio State's path to a top eight seed remains very visible. However, at least for now, it's probably time to cool the Jets on any NCAA championship talk in Columbus. Coming in at number seven this week, the 9-3 Aggies of Texas A&M. After earning 6-1 wins over conference foes Kentucky and Vanderbilt, the Aggies make their power rankings debut this week. Considering Texas A&M returned all of their starters from a team that went 21-8 last season, our Crack Rackets crew entered the year with high expectations for them. Though their highest ranked win comes over number 22 UCLA, they have yet to drop more than one flight in any of their nine victories. Also, the team's only losses have come against Ohio State, a loss to Michigan, a 4-3 thriller at indoors, and TCU. That each of those matches were played indoors, conditions that will never favor the Aggies, is certainly something to consider. In fact, the top 35 ranked trio of Val Vachero, Hattie Habib, and Juan Carlos Aguilar continue to prove as formidable as any top three in the country. With how talented Georgia has looked thus far, a top two finish in the SEC seems less certain for AM than it did in January. However, given the results, experience, and top-end talent this team possesses, a top-eight steed is still well within the Aggies' grasp this season. Number six this week, the 9-4 and four Horned Frogs of TCU. Folks, if you want to know what a team hitting their stride looks like, look no further than Fort Worth and the TCU Horned Frogs. The team earned two more top 20 wins this past week as they knocked off both Ole Miss and Stanford at home, extending their dual match winning streak to six straight. The team got wins from five different singles positions this weekend, demonstrating their stellar depth and ability to find multiple pathways to victory. With Texas still struggling to find its rhythm, and with all of the uncertainties surrounding Baylor, sorry Coach Boland, 
it feels like we're looking at our favorites heading into the Big 12 regular season play. Coming in at number 5, the 14-3 Michigan Wolverines. Routine shutout victories over Penn State, Brown, and BU, plus a couple of upsets to other teams, move my Wolverines up to number 5 this week. I know that compliments will only lead to jinxing them down the road, but it really does seem like Michigan's found their seven-man combo to roll with for the rest of the season. Head coach Adam Steinberg seems to have found his ideal doubles pairings in the lineup of Fenty Seymour, number two in the latest ITA rankings, Johnston and Styler, number 73, and Nick, uh, Nick Beattie and Harrison Brown. Throw in the sensational form of freshman Andre Styler in singles and the inspired play of seniors Connor Johnston and Nick Beattie, and the only lineup question lingering is, can they all stay healthy? A journey to Columbus looms later in the month, but for now, I'll end with one of my favorite cheers from Ann Arbor crowds. It's great to be a Michigan Wolverine. Coming in at number four this week, the 10-3 Wake Forest Demon Deacons. An impressive 4-3 win at Oklahoma State, followed by comfortable home victories over both Duke and UNC Greensboro, jolts coach Tony Bresky's team to number four in these power rankings. Though the doubles point continues to be a struggle for the Demon Deacons, they've managed to find multiple pathways to full points each match. The depth of this Wake roster continues to be its best asset, but given his start to the season, it's time to start talking about Barbotzer as one of the top number one singles players in the country. He's 4-0 with one DNF in his last five matches, and each of his wins have come against a ranked opponent. One last thing on the Demon Deacons. I won't call people out by name, but I received multiple messages last week arguing I'm way too bullish on Wake Forest. After all that went down over the past week, I wonder how y'all feel now. Coming in at number three this week, the 14-2 Florida Gators. After earning 7-0 victories over both Alabama and Auburn this weekend, the Gators have now won 16 straight regular season conference matches. Number two singles player Sam Riffis extended his dual match singles winning streak to five, and Oliver Crawford continues to find success with three straight wins at the top of the Gators lineup. Duarte Valle and Andy Andrade also continue to thrive, dropping a combined one set all weekend long. Add in the fact that Coach Brian Shelton seems convinced he's found his doubles pairings, and there's plenty of reasons to believe the Gators can run the SEC table once again in 2020. That being said, Florida seemingly continues to play a game of eeny, meeny, miny, mo when deciding which guys will start at the 5 and 6 positions. With the depth of their roster, that's fine in the regular season. However, as we get closer to May, it will be imperative that the Gators develop some semblance of continuity at the bottom of their lineup. Coming in at number 2 this week after another undefeated week themselves, the UNC Tar Heels. The past week saw the Tar Heels return to their dominant early season form. After cruising to a 6-1 victory over Virginia Tech, the team traveled to NC State and shut out the Wolfpack 4-0. Considering NC State's victories over Michigan, Texas, and Virginia, which is slightly less impressive, but still, the fact that the Tar Heels did not drop a set in singles against the Wolfpack feels that much more important. They also got four singles wins from Josh Peck and Brian Cernock this week, which after their respective performances against USC certainly helps to alleviate some of my concerns. It's hard to imagine UNC being pushed much during conference play, but if a conference loss is going to happen, it'll probably come during March. Four of their five next matches are against top 40 teams, and three of those matches will be on the road. Still, with Will Blumberg clicking on all cylinders and the depth this roster possesses, good luck knocking off the Tar Heels this season. After a 2-0 week of play, coming in at number one once again in these power rankings, the USC Trojans. Ryder Jackson's straight set loss at Oregon was the only blemish in another successful week for this year's national indoor champs. Here's how you know this team's legit. Coach Brett Macy pulled both Daniel Cooperman and Riley Smith from their singles lineup against Washington, and the team still dropped only one set during the match. Also, 
though Brandon Holt did not finish a match this weekend, he was up a set against both Oregon and Washington and appears to finally be back to full strength. Things get very fun for the Trojans over these next two weeks as they'll take on Wake Forest, Texas, and UCLA over that stretch of time. That being said, even if the Trojans drop one of those decisions, it's quite clear that this team possesses all of the traits needed to make a deep run in May. 